delighted to be here, and not just because of the 15-foot mounds of snow that I left behind. Um, I want to say a couple of things before I start. One is that this is going to be a bit of improv, because in meeting with students over the course of the day, I realized that I had not guessed correctly about what people were size, some of what's in the slides. The slides are going to be posted, so anything I skip is there. The other thing I want to say is I'm, this, I'm not going to do a, a typical talk. A typical talk would be something where I would come and I would present a paper. You would critique the paper. If I'm lucky, I'd get some really good criticism and I'd go home. Uh, I decided I didn't want to do that. Instead, I want to, um, I guess the word is hector you, nag you. Uh, I really want to make a case that um, you should worry about the problem that I've been worried about for a long time in conducting your own research and in interpreting other people's research. In the handout, the italics on you, the italicized you was lost, but it's supposed to be italicized. I want to convince you to worry. Um, and to do that, I'm going to present, if there's time, snippets of four studies, uh, some very sim two very simple snippets, two a, li a little more compl complicated. There's actually no need for four. Any one of them would buttress the argument I want to make. But I'm giving you four in part because there are flaws in any study. And while I'd be delighted to hear about the flaws in any of these, I don't want that to distract from the main argument that I'm making. And the last thing I want to say uh, by way of preface is you should feel free to interrupt at any time to ask questions, to argue, whatever. Um, I'd be happy for that. So this is the argument I want to make. And you can see from the tone of this first slide that I really am hectoring. My argument is we've known about the problems I'm going to talk about for a very long time, and people have ignored them. But anyway, so the question is, when did we first document? Well, first of all, the problem of people preparing kids for tests in ways that would inflate scores has been published in the psychometric literature for, what, over 60 years. If you read Don Campbell's classic paper, which I'm going to reference in a minute, he actually references test scores as an example. But we've had hard empirical evidence of score inflation for a quarter of a century. All right, since the first paper was presented, I believe, in 1991. I don't remember whether it's 1990 or 1991, even though it was one of mine, but it was around then. We've had hard evidence that this uh, bias is both variable and predictably vari uh, um, variable for at least 14 years in the published literature. That is, we know that it varies from school to school, from one type of kid to another. And we know that it varies systematically with variables that we typically put on the right-hand side of our models. Um, it's obvious, I think, but I'll come back to this, that the impact of this variable bias on research can be profound. But it's just ignored. I mean, that's an uncharitable way to put it, but it is ignored. I'm just now, I mentioned to a few of you, finishing uh, a review of a $1 million proposal that is entirely about the impact of demographics on scores. And there is not so much as a sentence about this problem in the, in the paper, in the proposal. And that's not atypical. So what I want to do is convince you that that's not acceptable. So here's what I want to do if there's time. And again, do not hesitate to interrupt me. Um, I want to give you a very cursory view of Campbell's Law and Score Inflation. Um, I misjudged. There's one piece of that that I had not planned to present that I think I should. I'll give you uh, however much evidence about differential inflation as there is time. It might be all four studies, it might not. And then I want to briefly come back to the implications for research, both your own research and your interpretation of other people's research. Oops, wrong button. All right, so the starting point is this. I, how many of you know Campbell's Law? I assume most of you know Campbell's Law, yes? If not Campbell's Law, you know Goodhart's Law, which is the same thing? No? All right. So some of you don't. I'll let you read it. This is uh, widely documented in all manner of fields. This link, which you'll be able to get off the web, is a, a paper by a, a monograph by Richard Rothstein that has, oh, I'm guessing 40 or 50 examples from different fields. It's been found in police work, in the fast food industry. If any, I know a number of you are uh, uh, in econo the economics of education. There is an enormous literature in healthcare economics on this problem. Um, but it turns out that Campbell actually specifically used test scores as an example. All right, that's the problem. 
And if you read the psychometric literature, the earliest reference I found is 1951, which is a, a, a chapter by E.F. Lindquist. Uh, I've been told that I've simply missed some things that were 20 years earlier. But it's not a new problem. All right, this is the first study ever done. I did it with Bob Lynn, uh, Steve Dunbar, and Laurie Shepard. I'm going back to the first one, even though it's a slower one to explain for a couple of reasons. One is that it's an RCT. It's one of the, it is the only one. Uh, that actually doesn't matter because most of the other studies use either the same kids or randomly equivalent groups of kids, even though they're not experiments. But the other two things that are important about this is that this was done in a district that I'm not allowed to name uh, that was, by the standards of 1988, very high stakes. By today's standard, it's ludicrously low stakes. There are no concrete rewards, no concrete sanctions, just embarrassment, being beaten up by the superintendent. All right, uh, and it also is, an ex I chose this example also because this one is the, the only study I know of that directly addressed the common criticism that comparisons of tests can be biased by motivational effects. All right, so had I given you, well, first, the scale on the left, I guess many of you won't know, it's grade equivalence. It's denominated in academic years and months. This is from third grade in the seventh month of the school year. So the national median score would be a 3.7. This is a very poor high minority district. So in 1986, which is the last year in which they were using uh, the blue test, and by the way, I'm turning around to, to point, but since most of you are students, don't turn around and point any more than you have to. I can't tell you how many job talks I've gone to where the person stood like this the entire time. The people who will hire you are out there um, and if you're lucky, you can get computer screens where you can draw on it here and you don't have to turn around. But the blue test, had I, had I put on more data, showed an increase just like the red test. Right? The blue and red tests were both commercial tests, commercially prepared tests. They were very similar. If you were in the field, you could tell the difference or would know the difference. If I were allowed to name them, Ed would know the difference and would be able to describe it. But they were very, very similar. So they had been going along, becoming more and more above average on the blue test when they bought a competing test, and, and the third graders dropped by half an academic year. All right. Then within four years, they were back where they had been. That sawtooth pattern was well documented in the field. People knew that it happened. The only thing new here is that we randomly assigned classrooms to testing conditions, and the largest group of classrooms got the exact same forms that had been used in the district up until four years earlier. So the charitable argument, which is, oh, the red test introduced new material, they've learned that in addition to what they knew before, was false. They, the, what they had learned had shifted from the blue test to the red test because the blue test score dropped by, coincidentally, exactly as much as the red test score had gone up. Now, the reason there is, a I say motivational issues were not an issue, is that we gave a parallel form, which is, say, a very similar form of the red test as to a sample of our classrooms because we were worried that the kids would say, oh, it's two weeks later, this one must not count. And in third grade, there was no difference in performance between our administration of the red test and the districts. In the fifth grade, there was no um, difference for girls, but there was for boys. The boys just blew it off. So we never presented the fifth grade results. All right, I'll give you only one more example. There are plenty more. This one is also old. I'm giving it to you for two other reasons. One is that this reflects a test that had, at least the portion we used, no multiple choice items, so the people who say score inflation, is, score inflation is a problem format have problems with this. The second is that the left-hand column is a high-stakes test in Kentucky. It was uh, really the precursor of NCLB. It was one of the first state tests that had concrete rewards and sanctions attached to changes in test scores. The right-hand side is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. The legislature, in enacting the program, in the statute, it, it is specified that the framework for the state high-stakes test has to be the framework of the national assessment. So that removes another argument that the comparison or the audit test is inappropriate. And what you see here is fairly typical gains on the high-stakes test that are eh, four times as big as the low-stakes test. Sometimes it's worse than that. Sometimes it's a little better. I've seen them. Well, there are some cases where there are gains, uh, it's essentially infinite. There are no gains on the uh, low stakes test and there are huge gains on the high stakes test. I could give you more, but they're all kind of the same story. All right. So this is where I realized this morning I had cut too much out of my slides. Well, I'll have to improvise a little. Why does this happen? The starting point is that tests are, the tests we're worried about. This would not be true of a test of 
rules of punctuation, for example. But the tests we worry about are very, very, very small samples. The test that was used until last year, to, the math test that was used to, uh, until last year in Massachusetts to determine whether a kid gets a high school diploma had 42 items that were scored for kids to represent 10 years of work. So I need to go ahead to something that I realized this morning would not be old hat to some people here, so pardon my fumbling with this. This is a little map of the process of creating a test. And the right-hand side that's not shaded is what's included or emphasized by the test. The, uh, the left-hand side, I'm sorry, the right-hand side that's shaded is material that's either dropped entirely or de-emphasized. So you start with some domain, as we say in the field, something you want to talk about. Could be uh, mastery of eighth grade mathematics, mastery of, of elementary algebra, whatever, the thing you want to talk about. And the first happens, thing that happens is you have to decide uh, what aspects of that domain you're actually going to include in whatever document provides a starting point. Now we call them standards, more, in many places they're curricula, whatever. All right? And if you compare these from state to state, you'll see a lot of stuff falls off the table. That's the right-hand box. Or it gets very little emphasis. I'm going to give you a concrete example of this in a moment. The next is you have to decide what portion of that you're going to test. You will typically find that either not all of it is tested or some of it is given a great deal of weight in the test and some of it is not. And those patterns are predictable. The key is that all of these patterns that I'm describing are to some degree predictable. The next is you have to decide from the things you're going to test, from the standards you're going to test, just what aspect of them you're going to test. So there was a standard in Massachusetts, I don't remember the wording, that said something about um, understanding of the properties of basic polygons. Which polygons? Which properties? One Boston math teacher in a survey some students ran with me years ago said, why would I teach you regular polygons? She didn't mean that they were unimportant. She meant that the Massachusetts test never had them. All right? This last part is, I'm going to show you one example, um, is much harder to describe. Once you just make all of these decisions, these non-random decisions, you have to decide how you're going to present the material. All right? So a basic problem in uh, first year algebra might be presented algebraically, it might be presented verbally, might be presented graphically, it might require translations between two of those. If it's a simple linear equation, it might always be, as in some states, positive quadrant one, or it might not. There are a lot of decisions that have to be made about presentation, and also about what you ask students to do in response. Those are predictable. All right, so if things are predictable in this way, and if you me just go to Barnes and Noble and buy a test prep book for whatever test you're interested in, uh, if they're predictable in this way, people figure it out. All right, now there are reasons why, a lot of reasons why they're predictable. One is that we want to be able to link test scores from year to year, and you can't do that if the tests are dramatically different. So there is some reasonable rationale for doing this, but it's done also partly because it's cheap and easy. It is really, really hard, I don't know if any of you have tried, to write a good test item. It's very difficult, takes a lot of time, and you usually fail. Uh, Steve Dunbar, who's done this now for a career for years, says it's the three R's. Review, revise, and reject. Um, so, I'm sorry. Oh, I just had a quick question, and you may be getting to this, but how much is there, I, I totally see that you can learn how to do it. How much variation in, is there, and how much, how quickly people learn how to do it? Like, is it a suit, because I, right. uh, you could have a very low growth or a high growth, but if they're kind of perfectly correlated, all we're really interested in is kind of where people are. You mean if it's uniformly done across? Yeah, so, uh, Ah, how, to, how to game it. Uh, I don't know of any empirical evidence that directly answers that. The two, two questions that bracket that I do know, that people learn very, very fast, and that the end result, and the end result sometimes being literally only a year later, is variable in predictable ways. But nobody that I know has charted out, say, the growth of inflation over time in low-income schools versus high-income schools, to my knowledge. That would be an interesting question, yes. right? I'm hoping to do that, actually, because you, to do that well, you have to have data from the starting point of the testing program and on some audit measure from the starting point, and we have that in Kentucky. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that. All right, so what happens if you, if you go by, I'm sorry, Ed. You, you can infer 
other differences in growth over time between low income and high income schools from that paper by Klein, Fetcher, Hamilton, and McCaffrey on the Texas Miracle? It's in here. Okay. It's the first of my four examples. Um, and I'm using that because it's the first, actually. Um, so we don't know, I mean, it might not have been linear in both groups. We don't know what the rates were over time, but at the end result is clear. All right, so go, buy, go look at a Princeton Review book if you really want to see this. Basically, people figure this out either on their own or have, they have someone do it for them. What's really astounding is that school districts and state governments do it for their teachers now. Um, and they can do this in a number of ways. This the vocabulary I'm going to use is not completely standard, but it's what my colleagues and I have used for years. One way you can do it is simply reallocating resources, primarily instructional time. It could be homework, parental nagging, all sorts of things, to focus more closely on the content of the tests. And you might say, well, why not? Well, because we have only so much time, and if you focus more on what is tested, the left-hand side of that chart I showed you, you're going to focus less on the right-hand side. And it turns out that the right-hand side is often what users of scores are interested in, or includes things that users of scores are interested in. The word coaching is used in all manner of different ways, but we use it to refer to uh, test preparation activities that are focused on small incidental characteristics of the test. It might be forms of presentation. It might be aspects, little aspects of content that are not made for, cho chosen for substantive reasons, irregular versus regular polygons. Uh, and the last option, of course, is just cheating, which is I'm not going to talk about just because there's nothing much to say. All right, so I want to give you a few concrete examples so you'll know that I'm not just making this up. Um, this is from a district just south of Boston, Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, this is, I suspect, no longer on their website, but for years, uh, until one of my students found it and publicized it, it was on their website. It was a PowerPoint presentation that the first page of which was a picture of the three primary secondary school text, math texts used in the district. And you picked your text. So I picked algebra. And what it gave you is a series of pages. Each page was a chapter in the book. And it was broken up into the sections. So this chapter, I don't remember what chapter seven was, had seven sections. The little red links, are they red? Sort of. But the little links are links to test items. Uh, the district went back and got all of the state's released test items for four years and linked every single one of them to one of the rows of this PowerPoint. All right? So in a matter of seconds, you know that if what you're, wor if you're really worried about whether your kids are going to be called proficient, you can skip five sections of chapter six, seven. It's not certain. Maybe this year they'll be inventive and add 7.5, but it's a pretty safe bet. And if you're not really too worried, uh, you don't have a lot of time, rather, you would just say, I'm not going to worry about 7.2, which is rarely tested. I'll just focus on 7.4. If you ask teachers if they do this, they will all tell you they do. I won't say all. Every survey I have seen that addresses this question has teachers saying, of course I do this. And if you ask them, a few studies have, are the things that you de-emphasize as a result things you consider important, they will say yes. That's, excuse me, reallocation. Co now for coaching, this is in your handouts. Another pointer for students, don't ever give a job talk where you say, well, I know you can't see this, but. Um, because if you can't see it, there's no point in putting it up. I couldn't redo these easily, so I, I, to make it more legible, I gave you handouts so you can read it. So I'd like you to read the first one, number two. Just signal when you've had a, a, a time to read it. All right? Very straightforward item. And if you looked only at this item, you'd say, well, nothing is wrong. They want to see whether kids can compare numbers written in scientific notation, and item two requires they do so. But now read the second one, which was two years later. All right? This is what I mean by similarity of representation. So let me give you a task. I tried this at, in a class at MIT a couple of weeks ago, and they, uh, they're all math and science students, and they immediately got it. So the question is, if you wanted to teach students to get this right, knowing that it's going to look like this most years, how could you do it without teaching them the underlying mathematics? What would you tell them to do? Look for the highest exponent. Look for the highest exponent. What if there are two exponents that are the same? 
Choose what? Choose the what? Biggest number. Which number? Mantissa. Okay. So two of you used the words exponent and mantissa. Bad idea. That involves learning math. They don't need to know what an exponent is. <laughs> there is absolutely no reason to teach them what an exponent is. You say, look at the little numbers on the right and pick the biggest one. If there's only one with that number, you're done. If there are two, you go to the left and look at the big numbers and pick the biggest number. They don't have to know what the, an exponent is. I, another one which I didn't include in today's slides was five items, or four or five items over six years that were asking kids, how, I mentioned this at lunch, uh, what device they would have to use to measure mass. The first year is the mass of a piece of cheese. The second year is the mass of a watermelon with a different student's name attached to it. And you could just train kids. If you see the word M-A-S-S, you don't actually have to speak English. Then look for the word S-C-A-L-E. You're done. Uh, now, I'm going to give you one more example of this because you may say, oh, well, this is ex exceptional. People don't do it. They do. All right. So take a look at this. This is from the Princeton Review's Cracking the MCAS Grade 10. All right. Anybody want to characterize this? If a kid was taught this way, would she be able to do something with the Pythagorean theorem later? Well, you say no. I think so. If they could manage to remember it. I mean, it's, it's horrible instruction. It's boring. It's completely free of mathematical intuition. But it gives them a rule. And if they can manage to memorize the rule, they can apply it. All right? Here's the bottom half. All right? So, among whom are these ratios popular? Item writers. Why? How many of you can calculate a square root manually? All right? So, so if it's in a non-calculator part of the test, you have to use an integer ratio. Now, if you actually look at items, and one of the things my group has done, which is uh, it, it was really painful as we took years of released items and organized them chronologically by standard. And when we were all done with this, we found that a test prep company was giving it away for free. But you'll see that um, this is rare. Because the notion of this, that uh, 169 is the square of 13 is something kids don't know. And they can't intuit. So what you'll see is this or maybe 6, 8, 10 in 80% or more of the items. So. Ask teachers, do you use this? Which I've done with Massachusetts teachers. They say, of course. And one of the students in one of my classes said, oh, you can simplify it. I said, oh, I can get more sim simpler than this. She said, look, she had taught a class called MCAS, that's the name of the test, preparation, which was for 11th grade students who'd failed the test in 10th grade. And she said, you don't worry about the kids who are five and six items below the cut score. They're not going to make it anyway. She was told by her principal, this is, I think, verbatim what she told me though, several years ago. Your job is to go in that room and come out seven months from now with two or three test items. That was her job, get kids close to the cut, above the cut. And she said, so you don't really have to nail this because you don't need a lot of items. So she said, I looked, and most of the items like this were about calculating the length of a ramp. So I just told my students, if you have to cal calculate the length of a ramp, you're going to use this ratio. All right? That's not an anomalous response. All right, so needless to say, if, if a teacher does this, and you then hire that student as a carpenter to build your roof, you would have a really, really serious problem. All right, so that's coaching. So that's the, I, I just wanted to give you this as background. That's not really what I wanted to talk about. What I want to talk about is this. This is the study that Ed referred to. This is the first study I know of. <laughs> there, there are lots more examples. There, uh, when, when you, if you can avoid thinking of them as horrifying, they're really kind of funny. Uh, but this is the first study I know of that documented that the problem of score inflation is systematically non-uniform. It's not the easiest graphic to read. What this is, this is, this is about the Texas miracle that helped get George Bush elected. W, that is, right? Um, 
This is, the scale is effect sizes. It's change in the test over a four-year period as a, a proportion of a standard deviation. Um, the blocks are whites, blacks, and Latinos. The light blue bar on the left is the state high stakes test at the time. The, medi uh, the medium blue bar in the middle is the state's sample on the national assessment, st their state representative samples. The dark blue bar is the nation as a whole on NAEP. And so, now these are gains. So what you see if you just look here is that blacks gained way, way more than whites. That's the Texas miracle or a big part of it. So it's three-tenths of a standard deviation versus almost five. It's a huge difference. If you look at the same two groups on the national assessment, there you have um, virtually no difference in gains. Virtually none. And in fact, what you see is that the, the progress, relative progress of blacks on the national assessment in Texas was slower than in the nation as a whole. All right, so that's what we have is a difference in four years, a bias in, uh, in the comparison between blacks and whites in four years of about, what is that, almost two-tenths of a standard deviation. And if you want to think that's anomalous, here's a more recent one. This is from the first three years of the recently deceased New York State testing program. They just replaced it with a common core test in 2013. So what you have is the, there the tabled entries are the white-black gap in eighth grade math scores in two, and in the first year of the state tests, 2006, the state results and the national assessment results were for all practical purposes identical, which gives me another thing I want to say to students, don't just copy your output and put five and six digits past the decimal point because they don't mean anything. I mean, two is a stretch. Um, three we do by convention because editors expect it, but the third digit is meaningless. So for all practical numbers and purposes, these are the same number. And the tests weren't the same, so that's pretty good finding. So then look at the size of the gap in 2009. Essentially a random change in national assessment gap and a decline of about a quarter of a standard deviation in the gap in the state test. Right? Completely consistent with actually a little worse than the Klein study I just showed you. All right, so these are the first two very simple examples of the four. The others take a little more time. We'll see how I, whether I can get through them. This is enough to make my argument. I don't need the, the other two. I'm gonna present the other two partly because they're, they're more interesting. All right, so if you don't have arguments or questions, I'll go on to the third one, which takes a little while. This is something that's now in review, so I can't give you the paper. Actually, there's a working paper on my website, which you can get if you want it. So Kentucky became the first state in the United States to switch to a common core test in 2012. And our argument was that, uh, let me step back a little bit here to the third bullet, go out of order. There is a fairly sizable literature. It's not a tip, it's a, for the most part, a terribly high quality literature, but it's large and consistent showing that inappropriate test prep is substantially more intense in schools that serve a high concentration of disadvantaged kids. All right? So we hypothesized that if we looked at the relative change in performance, we would find disadvantaged kids falling compared to others when the, a new test was introduced because the previous coaching wouldn't carry over. All right? We could only look at relative change because there's no linking between these tests. They're different tests. They're also on really fundamentally different scales if you, if you looked at the distribution. So we normalized the two and simply looked at the um, difference in normalized test scores between a kid in the grade X uh, in 2012, which is the, the common core test, uh, minus the kid's score in X minus, grade X minus one the previous year on the old score. Another little thing I don't have time to get into is we use this model because, how many of you know Lord's Paradox? Anybody know Lord's Paradox? Okay. We fitted a conventional covariate adjustment model and it failed our falsification test, so we said we're talking about change, we really better model change. Um, that's a story for another day. So our hypothesis was that kids would, who were hard to educate would fall, show a drop within schools and that schools with a high concentration of such kids would show a drop above and beyond that predicted by the individual characteristics of students. And what made Kentucky such a wonderful opportunity is that the obvious 
criticism, I mentioned this to a few of you earlier, the criticism I would have given if I'd seen this study without the piece I'm going to add is, how do you know that you're not finding this, if you find it, simply because more affluent schools were already teaching Common Core material? So Kentucky solved this problem for us by administering at almost the same time a brand new norm reference test that was not aligned to the Common Core. So we could simply take everything we did and just substitute one variable and replicate everything. Uh, it replicated to an uncanny degree. I mentioned to one of you this morning that we have one grade, which you'll see in a moment, where we didn't find what we were looking for, and that failure to find what we were looking for replicated as well. Everything replicated. So this had nothing to do with the new test. So we fitted, I'm not going to take time now, as we have, I don't think I'm going to take time to actually show you the models. Uh, there's some models there, and they'll be on the website um, for you to see, but the model is a very simple model. It's a very simple two-level model where we allowed the um, school intercepts to vary, but we did not allow the slopes to vary within schools, uh, within school slopes to vary across schools. We actually tried that and it didn't add anything. And so these are the results. Again, you have it in your handouts because you can't read it from where you are. Well, actually, some of you are young enough, you probably can. But, um, so, and these are grand mean, grand mean centered variables. So what we have in the school level portion of this is context effects. This is, so I'll walk through this. The shaded parts, you can barely see the shading on yours, are what you need to look at. So what you see is that within schools, poor kids dropped. They did not drop much. These are very small effects, but they dropped. And kids with IEPs dropped. And we think this is for the same reason. These are the kids within schools who are hardest to bring up to the proficient level, so they are the kids who create the greatest incentives to cut corners. All right? The thing I really wanted you to see, remember that our hypothesis based on the literature on test prep was that there would be big school level effects. So look at the first row, the shaded row under school level variables. And what you see is big effects in every grade except for seven to eight. That is seven in the old test, eight on the new test. Um, and these are context effects. This is the effect of having a lot of poor kids in the school above and beyond the individual effects of a kid being poor. All right? Now, this is misleading in, in, in an important way. Uh, the variables were standardized, actually normalized, at the student level. But that means that the coefficients for the school level variables are not directly comparable to the, to the uh, coefficients for the kids at the top. And so a, a simple way to deal with this is to look at the distribution of schools on the school level variables and just pick some percentiles and look at the impact of this uh, for those percentiles. So we picked the 25th and 75th percentiles on each of the predictor variables. And in our most extreme case, grade 6, 7, right here, uh, the impact of this, if you were to compare the schools at the 25th and 75th percentile of proportion poor, was a drop in a relative position of about 0.13 standard deviations. So these are pretty modest effects. And I think they're modest in part because it's not as though this second, these new tests were dropped in out of the sky. I mean, people, people had some notion about what was coming. So we didn't feel that we could really quantify anything with this. Um, but what we wanted to see whether, is whether this discrepancy in performance was predictable in the way that we assumed it would be based on prior research, and it was. Okay. So there's, plenty, there's more to argue about with this one than with the simple trends and mean differences. But if you don't have arguments, I'll go to one that's more complicated. Yeah? It's a relative position. So high-performing kids need less coaching on the old test, and so they move up on the new test. Right? All right. So that also, yes? So uh, one question about, about these results. So one thing that is correlated with having a lot of poor students mm -hmm. in your school is you have a lot of students who are performing low. And we're, right. we're sort of assuming some constant right. effect across the test where the students. So is it, is it's it probably right. schools where there's opportunity to like the MCAS example you gave right. is like where there's a lot of opportunity to, to teach. Right. right. I think it, that's one of the reasons why these effects are small because if you have a, a school with a lot of disadvantaged kids and they're way, way below proficient, you don't really have that much incentive to cut corners. And we have other things that I didn't bring with me 
that suggests that the proportion of kids near the proficient cut score is actually a fairly substantial predictor of this. Right? So this is a really crude look. I mean, and it is making the assumption that you suggested that we shouldn't make. Right? I mean, really what you'd want is some more direct measure of the amount of pressure schools f face to raise scores rather than, right? That's really what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, uh, my interpretation of this is speculative, but my interpretation of this is that the greater the pressure to raise scores, the more likely you are to cut corners. And schools with a lot of poor kids have a lot of kids who create that incentive, right? Um, okay. Hmm? Do you yeah. see a percent black in Kansas? Thank you. Good question. Anybody know the demographics of Kentucky? Uh, black students in Kentucky are almost entirely located in two districts, Louisville and uh, Fayette, which is Lexington, which is one of the most, uh, uh, Lexington is one of the most advantaged districts in the state. The disadvantaged group in Kentucky is Appalachian kids. And we actually tried an Appalachian variable and didn't really produce much. We have other results. This is the only, we've done, we have only a modest amount of this kind of work. This is the only case where the black and proportion black variable didn't matter. And in fact, in the next study, I'm going to show you it did matter. OK? All right, should I go on, or other questions? You're one of the first groups ever to see this, so I assume there are things wrong that you will find. But uh, if not, I'll go on. And you can always email me. If you have later thoughts about things that are wrong, just email me. All right, so this is going to take a little more time. So I, I, knowing who's in the room, some of you know this literature better than I. There is a, uh, a modest but consistent literature that has found that uh, value-added uh, ratings of teachers are inconsistent across tests. Now, I'm using value-added in a very, very loose way, the way the authors of the papers use it. In many cases, they're really not value-added models at all, but simple covariate adjustment models, but it doesn't matter for the present purposes. So uh, there are three studies I've listed. This is the MET project. The Corcoran paper is an excellent one, but I don't think it's been published yet. It's by um, Sean Corcoran, Jen Jennings, and uh, who's the third author? author? Maybe Beveridge. A really excellent paper. The people who've argued about this have argued about it in terms of the degree of consistency in ratings. So one group says, well, 0.5 isn't very good, but that's still signal. It's usable. And the other group says, 0.5 is horrible. There's too much noise. It's not usable. Um, so the person I did this paper with, a, a former student, um, and I asked what I thought was the obvious question, can we adduce any additional evidence that would address other aspects of validity? All right. The obvious question, given what I've shown you, is the risk that there might be systematic biases in the uh, ratings based on uh, the high stakes test. All right. We did not have teacher links to retreat to the school level, but it doesn't really matter that much. It, probably means that the level two effects are weaker because some teachers in a school will do test prep less than others. But it's, for our purposes, it was uh, good enough. All right, so this is a paper with Hui Lang Ng. Uh, it is um, actually also in revision now. There is a, a working paper for, for a portion of this that comes out of her dissertation. It's on my website if you'd like to see it. So we constructed ratings uh, on uh, both high stakes and lower stakes tests. I think there's another slide I had. I don't think I took it out that tells you what we did. Yes, OK. Uh, and so we had three hypotheses. One is that score differences between a high stakes and lower stakes test would be predicted by the variables shown in earlier research to be uh, correlated with the amount of inappropriate test prep, like poverty. Uh, the second part, I think, is going to take a fair amount of time. Is anybody here familiar with the multi-trait, multi-method notion? No? Mm -mm. Somebody? Yeah, well, you, you certainly. <laughs> uh, you should be, so well, I'll take the time for it. Um, uh, we wanted to check to see whether the ratings were too consistent across subjects within a test relative to within subjects across tests. And uh, we predicted that the uh, validity evidence would be worse at the between school level because test prep is a school or teacher level variable, not a student level variable for the most part. All right. So 
It was Houston. Everybody picks on Houston. Why does everybody pick on Houston? Because they have both a high stakes and a lower stakes test, and they have for a long time. Actually, if you read the earlier research, they deserve being picked on anyway, but that's not why people pick on them. Um, we picked Houston solely because we could get the data we needed from Houston. It's a very poor district, which is relevant to this. I suggest that uh, that probably is causing uh, a downward bias in some of our results. This is old data. The uh, two tests were the TAS, which was the sort of archetypal high stakes test of the time, and the Stanford achievement test, the SAT-9. Uh, so we had two outcomes, reading and math, in two years. Uh, we found the second line actually is suggestive of gaming that almost nobody lacked a Stanford test, but uh, about 10% lacked a, uh, a high stakes test score, which is exactly the stuff that you'd expect from, what you'd expect from work like David Figlio's. Um, so for most of this, uh, uh, we used the kids who were in both, which is uh, about 18,000 kids, and we, for obvious reasons, could only include schools that had kids tested in both uh, tests, which is most. All right. So here's where, let's see, we have, uh, yeah, I'm going to actually skip. I have slides that show these models in Greek. Uh, if you want them, they will be on the website. I don't think I'm going to take 10 minutes to walk through them. I'll just tell you what kinds of models we used. If you want to, I can go back to them. But um, for estimates of the score discrepancy at the, um, these are all mixed models. All the change is what we had on the right-hand side. Uh, we wanted, uh, for the student level difference, we had three level models, kids uh, nested within um, school, nested within a year, or crossed with a year, sorry, the last. Um, the, for school estimates, for the, um, which we used for the multi-trait, multi-method analysis, we actually did 12 models. Uh, it was Hui Leng's idea that we should follow J.R. Lockwood's good example and do enough models that nobody could say that whatever we found was model dependent. So we had both um, covariate adjustment models and gain score models, and we had uh, six of each varying in which covariates were on the right-hand side. And the bottom line there is it made no difference to speak of which models we used. And for the um, models to estimate student-level multi-trait multi-method, we needed some estimate, pooled estimate, pooled across schools of within-school correlations. And so that was a two-level random intercept, uh, random slope model. The random slope was the correlation between tests within schools. Again, if you want me to, I can go through the, the models are all here, but it'll take a lot of time, and I, I think it might make more sense to focus on the substance. So just to put it in perspective, this is the best and worst case we found in terms of the consistency of ratings. Uh, it was the case that, in general, uh, math was somewhat more consistent than reading. I find this utterly perplexing. It's not what I anticipated. Uh, but it was not the case that the math coefficients were all like this, you know, above 0.5, and the reading were all below 0.3. Um, but these were the best and worst um, uh, cases from 48 uh, correlations. They're Spearman rank order correlations. These, are, are, these you can't read very well. These are the ranks on the high stakes versus ranks on the low stakes. So you really don't have to go much further than here to know that we've got Apart from validity evidence, we have a really serious problem, right? I mean, if you basically want to say to, uh, let's take uh, this school, you ought to be punished because you're low on the high, you have a low rank on the high stakes test, but you have a high, stakes, uh, high rank on the low stakes test, it's a little hard to justify, but that's just a matter of consistency. All right, so what are the actual results? Um, all right, this is also in your handouts because you probably can't see it terribly well. Yeah. yeah. Do you know the correlation between, on the low stakes test between like adjacent years for a school? Like uh, do we have it? Yes. Do I know it? Um, no. I mean, normally those would be well into the 0.7s, I would expect, but I don't remember them from this particular data set. Uh, actually, let me use that as a, a as a reason for an aside, um, when people who don't spend their time uh, uh, de depressingly immersed in it think about um, score inflation, they often think in terms of correlations. This is not a matter of correlations. Because what we're worried about is that a distribution is shifting to the right faster than it should be. Right? When you calculate a correlation, you're subtracting the means. 
And this is not an academic concern. I did a paper with Sheila Barron in the late 1990s with Kentucky data where we looked, we saw that um, scores on, for kids who took both tests, scores on the ACT college admissions test in mathematics were absolutely flat, while scores on the 11th grade high stakes math test went up about seven tenths of a standard deviation. All right? During that time, the school level and student level correlations were pretty much stable. So you were not really changing the degree of consistency between tests, you were just moving one distribution up. All right? So um, I'm not sure if that's why you were getting at your question, but. No, it's just sort of, I mean, this sort of this old argument from Tom and Dan and Doug, but some of this is small samples of them in one pool, and I'm just saying. Well, that's right. However, let me go back. If you're familiar with the MET stuff, uh, do, do, do. That's the paper to look at because they were looking at the correlation between estimated stable components of the test scores, and they still were terrible. All right, but that's a question of reliability, and I want to go beyond that. All right, so here is um, what predicts the difference in student level difference in scores, and the shading, um, the, the, in this case, this is from a different paper, so it's organized differently. The relevant variables are all above the line, the relevant fixed effects. So what you have is that the difference is larger. That means in the wrong direction. For non-white kids, the second row is that they were larger, again, in the wrong direction. That is, um, mm -hmm. high-stakes test scores were high relative to low-stakes test scores. For kids classified as economically disadvantaged, that's uh, free and reduced price lunch plus a few other things in Houston. Um, then the school mean non-white and school mean uh, economically disadvantaged, these two, or it's just so highly correlated that we didn't put them in the same model. So you can use whichever of those coefficients you want, but you can see that they are, that the, those proportions, and again, this is grand mean centered, are, ve are very highly related to the student level difference in scores. So this was our first evidence. We just wanted to see whether the patterns in score differences align with the research on differences in test preparation, and they do. All right, yeah. Uh, it may. Um, let me give you two answers to that. Uh, there's a paper by Andrew Ho and a, a former student, uh, former master's student actually, uh, Carol Yu, uh, which d documents this looking at a lot of, of, of tests. But high stakes tests tend to develop, in this country, tend to develop um, right hand censoring really, really quickly. All right, so the different scaling methods that states use deal with that in different ways, but there is always a risk that there's some distortion in these group comparisons because the Asian kids are the first to hit that, the white kids come second. And in fact, it could well be that, the, that some of this is just the fact that white kids were beginning to hit the ceiling faster than, than black kids. That's absolutely right. Um, all right, so that's the easy one to explain. This is the hard one to explain. How much time? We go to f five, right? I'm completely disoriented in terms of time. So, um, so I just got in last night. All right, so here's the basic conceptual problem. And this particular example is I'm taking from an old psychometrics text, but it, uh, it's actually new relative to the idea, which comes from a paper in 1959, I believe. Campbell, it was Campbell Fisk, 1959, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is a really old idea. Uh, the idea is that you want the variables that you're interested in to show variation because of the construct they're supposed to measure, not because of the way you chose to measure them. So this example is, suppose you are conducting a study on, self, uh, on uh, anxiety and depression. Right? There are lots of ways you could measure that. You could use reports of other people. You could use observational me measures, you could use self-report measures. But let's just say that you're comparing self-report measures and, um, um, uh, and um, observational measures. All right. This represents a matrix of correlations. Uh, it's duplicative. You don't need all of them to see the point. So we can dismiss the green ones on the diagonal. Uh, looking at the top cell, that's the correlation of 
self-reports of anxiety with self-reports of anxiety. Conceptually, that's, that's just a, a reliability, the correlation of one measure of something versus another instance of the same measure of the same thing. That's a reliability coefficient. So we're now worried about the diagonal. So let's see, which one is better to take next? Um, let's take the blue. So what you'd like is to say, be able to say, it doesn't make any difference which measure I use. Whichever I'm using it at one point in the study or another, I get the same answer. So you want these blue ones, which in the literature are called trait measures, to be very high correlations. You want the, the first blue one on the left is the correlation between an observational measure of anxiety and a self-report measure of anxiety, and you want those to be really high. The higher, the better. Then there's the red, which is self-report of depression correlated with self-report of anxiety. They, sh they are not measuring the same thing. They're measures, in theory, they're measuring different things, but with the same method of measurement. And so what you want is for that correlation to be as low as possible. Now, in, when this is applied to test scores, um, you don't get things near zero and things near one. You get differences that are fairly small. But you want the differences to be in this direction. You want the method of measurement to matter less than what you're measuring. Otherwise, you can't go to people and say, hey, I'm measuring x, because you're, in fact, just reflecting a method of measurement. OK, is the principle OK? All right. For those of you who uh, end up at some point taking a measurement course, the variant of this that you'll come across in, in an introductory measurement course is what's called convergent discriminant evidence of validity, where you expect the correlation between two math tests to be higher than a correlation between a math and a reading test, for example, which is how we're going to use it. All right. That took less time than I thought it would. Um, so either I did it too fast or you really you understood it faster than I thought you would. So let me just um, take stock. All right. So we're almost up to where we can argue. So this is the results. The results of this kind of thing are very s simple to, to present. Uh, but it's initially kind of confusing, so I'll, I'll take my time with it. This is the school level results. Right? These are correlations between school means on uh, scores on two tests and two subjects. So the first column is within subjects in reading. And the uh, correlations, 0.3 and 0.43, are the correlations between school ratings based on one reading test and school ratings based on the other reading test. Now, that column alone ought to give you real pause. I mean, those numbers are really, really small. But that's not the point of this. All right, the next column over, these are, these are I think I use the same color coding. These are the blue. These are the trait correlations. We want these to be as high as possible. Because you want to be able to say to parents or whomever, these results reflect kids' reading, not which test we use to measure reading. The next column is the within subjects correlations in math, which are surprisingly much better. And I really don't understand that, because it's easier to um, prepare kids inappropriately for a math test than a reading test, and that you'd expect if that affects correlations, which it might not, that they would depress those correlations more. The really troubling one is this. These are the correlations within the high-stakes test across subjects. Now, these are school means. And so what this tells you, I'm going to use the worst case in this whole matrix to make the point, and it is, but it is the worst case. If you want to know a school's rating in reading, value-added rating in reading, what you should ask for on the high-stakes test, what you should ask for is its rating in mathematics. Because that correlation is more than double the correlation of the rating based on a lower-stakes test score of the same subject. That's a smoking gun. That's very bad news. What mitigates this a little bit is this number right here. The, the right-hand column is the within test correlations for the low stakes test. And um, these numbers are a little higher, especially that, than they ought to be also. Now, the, uh, the two rows are just refer to the covariates in the gain score and, and, um, uh, and um, 
covariate adjustment models, you can see that it doesn't actually make a whole lot of difference what you put on the right-hand side. It makes a little difference. But the storyline is basically the same. So the good news in this, or the bad news in this, rather, is those three numbers. And what attenuates that bad news a, li a little bit is it seems to be happening to some degree on the low stakes test also. But this is, I think, unarguably evidence of bias in the test scores. This just should not be happening. All right. Now, our hypothesis, I'm actually going to finish early. Um, my hypothesis. This is on the high stakes test? Hmm? I mean, this is the high stakes is test. Is there prior evidence of this happening? Like you said, like the, for instance, the study they did before was much lower stakes than the data that people are experiencing now. Like, is this a new finding, or is this fair? This is from, uh, from over 10 years ago. I would guess, this is purely a guess, that if you could replicate this now, it would be worse. And the reason is because the pressure is much more intense, and especially if you could do it at the teacher level, the pressure is now localized for individual teachers, whereas it was not at this time, it was school level. I don't know of any other paper of this sort. I mean, if anyone here does, I'd love to see it, but as far as I know, this is it so far. So that would be a wonderful dissertation, to replicate this with something newer. Ben's gonna do it. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, the SAT-9 is a little broader, but the district actually commissioned an, an alignment study that was done by Andy Porter and I forget who else, and they found a fairly high degree of alignment between the two tests. I mean, the, the, the SAT, is, it's predictable that the Stanford be a little broader because those tests like that are designed to be marketed broadly, and the traditional way of building those tests is to survey curricula everywhere and to try to give something to everybody, whereas the people in Texas didn't care what was tested in Oklahoma. It just was of no relevance to them. Right? But the degree of alignment was pretty substantial. Um, yeah? So th this is going to be pushing things a little bit. But what I really find myself wondering is its prediction in terms of kids' long-run outcomes. Because right. I could think of kind of an alternative story, which is that something like the SAT-9 is so broad that it's no way that it could ever pick up what schools do, that it only is picking up kind of abilities of students and the great variation in abilities of students. And by focusing the mm -hmm. test on what you're, you're having kids learn in school, you're somehow getting more at right. what kids are learning. And so I don't know if there is a way of looking at high school graduation uh, and that in well, uh, there might be. Actually, that's something my little group has been trying to figure out how to do. I mean, the data constraints are really the problem. Yeah. Did you circulate papers by Jim Popham while you were still in the faculty? That sounds like that's the Jim Popham. Jim Popham has for years argued that traditional norm reference achievement tests are not instructionally sensitive and that they measure things like SES and so on. I think it's actually nonsense. I mean, if you look at the, the actual items, um, I mean, I can't see any reason why most of them would, would be insensitive to instruction. But I didn't read that, and I don't know anything about testing. So this well, <laughs> you now have a second career. Since he's retired, you can take Jim Hobbins' place. Uh, but I think the answer is we just don't know. I mean, the, the research on these kinds of differences uh, are, is so sparse. I think we just don't know. And it's going to stay sparse. I mean, if you think about this, if you... If you ask, and I mentioned this to one person when, earlier, uh, if you go to a state or a large district and say, I'd like access to your data to do this kind of stuff, they're really not very welcoming. Right? Um, and I, not only do they usually say no, um, but in, I think, at least four cases uh, that I, I was involved in, they just pull the plug later and say, whoa, whoa we don't, <laughs> we're not going to do this. And they just don't let you have the data. But I think you're right. We, we need to replicate it. We need to replicate it with longer term outcomes. Because you can imagine like a world where it doesn't really matter what curriculum you teach as long as you teach that curriculum. Right? Well, let me see if I brought the slides that are relevant to that because that's the argument between Joel Klein and David Steiner. And I did. Oh, great. So let me divert myself a moment here. This is, uh, this is, this is the graph that got me my data. So what happened in New York State, which is really unusual, is that because, in part because of the political controversy about Joel Klein's policies in New York City, the press became extremely skeptical 
about um, uh, the big gains that were being reported every year, to the point where literally every year, the, the, not only the print media, but television stations were calling the, uh, calling the gains into doubt. Some actually talked about inflation, some talked about what they felt was malfeasance, but nobody believed this stuff anymore. All right? So in 2009, the state brought in a new commissioner, and the Board of Regents, which is the State Board of Education, elected a, a, new, ch a new chancellor. And they got word, the blue is the scores on this, uh, the state's high stakes eighth grade math test. I think they used eighth grade eight, yep. And scale is again proportions of a standard deviation. The red is the state's national assessment scores. And they had gotten an embargoed copy of this and, um, and called a group of people together to decide what to say about it. And the state, much to its credit, the commissioner and the, and the head of the Board of Regents went to the press and said, this shows that there is something fundamentally wrong with our testing program. And they actually immediately, this is truly remarkable. I can think of almost no cases where anybody has done this. Uh, and I've been doing this kind of work for 25 years. They then told their contractor that the test has to be broader from here on out and we want to tr you to try to make it less predictable. All right? And in fact, if you look at their trend lines, they flattened out after that. All right, so that was the state's response. Joel Klein's response is, I don't care about the red line. Why would I care about the national assessment? The blue test tests what we're concerned about, we being New York. So I gave two answers to that. One is, let's say an employer in Hoboken, New Jersey is employing people coming out of New York high schools and New Jersey high schools. Will that employer say, oh, to you, you're from New York. Ah, I'm sorry, you're from New York. You don't need to know this other stuff. That, we'll let the New Jersey kids do that. Of course not. There's a basket of skills they want kids to have. And they don't frankly care in most cases which subset, if you think about that sampling, the state has done. Um, and the other is you'd have to be able to say to parents that when we say your kids are doing better, we don't mean most of what's on the national assessment. Now, Jen Jennings did something uh, that I was embarrassed never to have thought to do before. Uh, she said, well, we have five content strands in the national assessment. Why don't we just plot out those strands and put it next to information about the weight those strands get on the state test? And the answer is, this gain comes from one of the five national assessment strands, algebra. So you'd have to, to take your argument in the New York case, you'd have to say, the other four content strands in New York don't matter. That's a really hard row to hoe. So again, the acid test will be later outcomes, right? And we just don't have much work of that sort yet. All right, so let me go back. Yeah, I, uh, should I go back to where I was? That's similar to Susanna's about like sort of that is related to long run outcomes. And I'm partly thinking about Raj Chetty and mm -hmm. Freeman, Jonah's paper about teachers and long run outcomes. So it seems like what you're telling one way to read what you're telling us is that tests may be measuring a little bit of math, and they're also measuring a school or teacher's ability to teach their kids how to take tests well. Right. right? Uh, and maybe Maybe for long run, so, so this is maybe an implausible hypothesis, but maybe for long run labor market success, it, it, it's important to know some math. It's also important to know skills uh, that may be correlated with learning how to gain tests. That is, I can yeah. imagine a teacher who's right. really good at teaching you sort of how to navigate the system and, and right. follow the rules. And those things are important for... Right. Uh, it's, labor it's possible. You just partially helped me in an argument with Dave Deming. We've been having an argument this week about whether Raj Chetty did enough to stress that he did not use tests like this in his study. He used low stakes tests. So, and I kept saying, no, he has not done enough. And Dave said, yes, he has done enough. So you're, you just gave me a little more ammunition. Uh, <laughs> it's safe to tell him now. Uh, um, um, so the real answer is, no one knows which of the things that people use for gaming might actually have some ancillary benefit. I mean, but if you go back to the concrete examples I showed you, it's hard to imagine that learning about Pythagorean triples is really going to help people in, in later life. Or, or learning that if somebody happens to set up scientific notation in this format, you can look at the little numbers first, right? Um, what I'm imagining is a teacher who, know, who recognizes that the Pythagorean triples and the exponents are ways to succeed on the test, which is 
culture. And sort of that kind of individual is also someone who's spending time teaching others. It's possible, but that's a different argument. That's saying that person is also doing other behaviors that are useful. And maybe they can do those because they're saving time. Well, maybe. Uh, I don't know of any research that comes even remotely close to answering that question. Um, and in fact, one of the gaps in this, in this literature is that uh, I mentioned this, I guess to you, I think I mentioned to you, Ben, that we don't have studies that actually link how teachers prepare kids for tests with any of this empirical evidence about scores. They're two separate literatures. And so when I and my colleagues did some work where we, we tried to produce novel audit items that you can seed into tests, which we've done a number of times. We just looked at the items and guessed at how people would um, coach, and we guessed wrong. I mean, the right way to do that would be to do serious qualitative work in schools and find out what test prep activities are going on, and then tailor test items to measure those things. Nobody's done that. Actually, a group that I was working with in Columbia was doing it, and then uh, in the last few months, um, since I got back from, I was there in November, and since that time, both the director of the agency and the chief of evaluation, who are my key contacts, resigned. So it's no longer happening. I, I still think that there may be some measurement error issues in such a general test in terms of trying to pick up what a school is doing or what a teacher is doing. And Do you mean measurement error or inappropriate content? I, mean, well, I think it's a question of what's more predictive later on. Well, that's, I, th I think it is. But you could also phrase, in terms of contemporaneous outcomes, you, you can ask it another way. Um, if you were an employer and you had the option of screening kids on the, what I think it's now about 115 items on the national assessment or the 42 items in Massachusetts, which would you prefer? And I'm not talking about kids' skills. I'm talking yeah. about the contribution of teachers or schools okay. to them. Because right. kids' skills, you just want the measure of their skills. Right. Uh, that's true. That's true. I just, there's just no research to answer that question. I mean, I would love to see it done. We should talk. I'd love to see this done, but I just can't think of any studies that directly address that. Because even the studies that have now looked at long-term outcomes, like Dave Demings, don't get into that little level of micro detail about what's going on in schools. So we're talking about different contexts in which we use these test scores. So if you had something just like a randomized control trial or like an RD or something, you know, fairly proximate outcomes test score one year later for some kids are given a math curriculum. Like based on what you know from this, do you think that measure is learned or do you think it's overinflated even in that context? That's a really, let's actually hold on to that because where I want to go in about five minutes is a list of questions about which analyses are affected. All right, so hold on to that. Let me quickly show you one other thing and then we can get to your kind of question. So one of our last predictions was that things would look better within schools than between, though I think I phrased it the other way around, worse between schools than within. So this is the within school multi-trait, multi-method analysis. So what this is, is the between school pooling of within school correlations. All right, the, calcula the slopes vary within schools, we pooled it across schools. And what you see is that um, this is now lower, which it should be. So again, these differences are not all lined up the way they should be. Some of them are a little, correlations are a little bigger or smaller than they ought to be. But in general, in broad brush, they do suggest that the problem is worse between schools than within schools, which is as it should be if it's a bias from test preparation. The ideal, and I just didn't have the data, would be to do it in three levels, because what you'd want to capture is the variation between teachers within schools, and I just had no ability with this data set to do that. All right, so let me get to the depressing part. Uh, if you're not already there. So why should you worry about this? This should be pretty obvious. I mean, the aggregate inflation problem is, is straightforward. If you have a bias of, as is typical, anywhere from a third to two thirds of a, actually uh, more like a third to three quarters of a standard deviation in score gains, then you, obviously aggregate evaluations are wrong. And by the way, a, piece, a useful piece of information for those of you, most, since most of you don't deal with test scores at this level of detail, is that if you look at large scale assessments 
and ask how, what is the range of increases or decreases, rates of increase or decrease that you find in the absence of corruption of scores, the answer is I don't know of anything bigger than uh, 5 hundredths of a standard deviation a year. And that's very big. The biggest I know of is fourth grade math on the national assessment, which is I think now about 4.4, 0.044, 0.045, something like that. During the years of the big decline and upturn, which I studied when I first started in the measurement area, uh, the typical was more like 0.035, right? So when, we, when I talk about a bias of half a standard deviation, that's huge compared to real gains. Absolutely enormous, all right? So that's the part that people have known a long time. But it's the differential inflation that really bothers me because if inflation is differential across groups like poor kids and black kids and IEP, kids with IEPs, and you're putting those variables on the right-hand side of your model, the answer is pretty clear. I mean, you just can't trust anything you get out of it. And since the bias overall is so large, you don't need really large correlations between the bias and the right-hand side variables to mess things up. It can be, those can be fairly modest correlations. And what makes this even worse is the fact that the research is so limited. It's not like if you get data from California, you can say, well, we have data from 15 other states that suggests here's the range of the bias for black versus white comparisons. And what little we do have suggests that it's really variable from place to place. For example, we replicated the Kentucky work in New York State, and it did not, or tried to, it didn't replicate. And I think it didn't replicate because in New York State, New York City was an outlier. It started preparing kids for the new Common Core test two or three years in advance. And where are poor and black kids in New York State? Overwhelmingly in New York City, right? So it's not as though you can turn to a big copious and consistent literature and say, as people used to do with, with the effects of clustering and say, I know roughly what the design effect ought to be. I'll just, you know, use that factor with my standard errors. Ooh, that would be wonderful. I don't know of anyone who's done that, but that would be absolutely wonderful. It just seems like with the modern data that we can probably track teachers that way and try to think a little bit about the path analysis that might happen as a, a teacher moves either into one of those environments or out of one of those. Well, maybe. Let me get back to one last really uh, serious problem, which is that we have lots of data for the high stakes part of it. We have very little data for the other side. All right, so, so what to do? This is the really depressing part. All right, so. Most of you are students, you're faced with really severe pressure to publish. Um, I can get away with not publishing now, I can't be punished anymore, but you can't, right? And there's an enormous trove of data out there, and it looks really good. Uh, there's an enormous trove of high stakes data, that is. There's very little low stakes data, and so the pressure is, use it. Well, so what can you do? There's a Nancy Reagan approach, you can just say no. Um, that's really hard to do because you have to publish, right? Sometimes, your paper, you have access to lower stakes or low stakes data. That's pretty rare, but sometimes it's, by the way, much more common to have that at the really aggregate level as you did. It's much rarer to have it at the school level and really rare to have it at the teacher level. So the national assessment, for instance, has 25 kids, I think still 25 kids per school, right? Per grade, I think that's what it is, something like that. Very small. And so I've actually tried a bunch of school level stuff with, with merging NAEP to, actually you're not allowed to merge NAEP to other things. They say you merge other things to NAEP. It's the same thing, but you have to say it that way. And you don't get much at the school level because it's just so, no, so noisy. All right. There are occasionally cases where you might be able to use a lower stakes test to validate the high, high stakes test in broad patterns. Um, there are states where inflation has not been very severe. There are some districts that use second test on a sample basis, and you could use that not necessarily at the school level, but at a more aggregate level to verify that the high stakes tests are okay. There aren't many of those. And then this other options with a, a question mark is your question, all right? If you don't have the good luck to have some second source of data, what can you do analytically? And the question you raised is one I really had not thought of, that um, if you're talking about an RD design, you're asking about whether the bias is variable in a very, very, very narrow range, and maybe not. So maybe that design is safe, but that's the question I want to leave you with. If you're not willing to do the, the Nancy Reagan approach, 
and you're not lucky enough to have access to lower stakes data, then the question is, is there anything analytical you can do to solve this problem? And your suggestion is the first I've heard that sounds plausible. Uh, just randomize everything? Well, it's not, <laughs> well that, that will do it. If you randomize everything, there's no bias, there's nothing. But um, no, the fact, I hadn't really thought about the fact that, in fact, I hadn't at all thought about the fact that in RD design, you're taking such a narrow slice of the distribution uh, that maybe it would work. But other than that, and that's something I really want to think about, but other than that, I don't know what you can do. All right, so again, go with this in mind as you read journals, just look and see how often people pay attention to these uh, problems. And the answer is very, very rarely. Yep? Are you going to uh, say anything or would you say something about the new wave of common core testing that's coming? I'd be happy to. I, he's not a plant. But I'm, uh, uh, if you look at the, what's been written and about the new, like the consortium tests, the Smarter Balance and Park, and the rhetoric that's out there, uh, there is, I think, I mean, there are people who talk to me about this. Derek Briggs is one of them. I think they don't address this at all. all right? they're, they're concerned about the... Uh, level of complexity of skills that are measured. They're concerned about the uh, restriction of formats in traditional testing, things of that sort. But um, I searched, actually, in response to a review that uh, Derek gave me of a paper of mine that is soon to come out, and I could not find anything, neither could he actually point me to anything, in the literature on the, on the consortium assessments that deals with the question of predictability. In fact, if you search, you'll find the reverse. All right, so. What test vendors want to do in many cases is to find ways to replicate items over time that look very similar. And it's not just a matter of cost, it's a matter of comparability and linking. So if you take the essay, you want it to be the case that if you look at kids for undergraduate admissions, you don't want to care whether they took the SAT in October or November. Right? So the, the tests have to be very, very similar, which is why ETS was one of the pioneers in looking at computerized algorithms for item generation and so on. But anything that constrains the creation of items is going to create predictability. Right? That, that isn't to say we can do without con those constraints, but that's the trade-off. Right? So if you look at the smarter balance materials, for instance, they make a big deal of the fact that they're using task models. Task models will introduce predictability, not reduce it. So I don't think it's going to solve the problem. And the, the other thing that's in, going on in the popular debate about them is that uh, we are essentially replicating the policy debate of 1988 or 1987 when people got very enthusiastic about performance assessment and thought performance assessment is going to solve this problem. We have exactly one study, one slide from which I showed you, but I know of only one study that directly addressed that question and it found that performance assessment does not, in fact, reduce the problem of inflation. In fact, the Kentucky study that, from which I took that one slide has some of the largest uh, instances of inflation, that and one other study that Ron Hamilton uh, was involved in, have some of the largest instances of score inflation of any, anything in the published literature. So I think they're dodging the issue. I don't think they're deliberately dodging the issue, but I think they're simply not confronting the problem. Yeah. What sort of, right. What's some practical advice to policymakers seeking to support more meaningful and okay. broad learning experiences for children while still uh, yep. existing in some kind of accountability? All right. Well, you give me license to speculate because there's, there are no good tests of different kinds of accountability systems compared directly to each other. But one thing you mentioned, which is obviously put more into the system than 
test scores. I mean, in, in theory, if you could go into classrooms and say, here are the 20 most important things I want to see in a school, that's what should be valued in an accountability system. So that helps. Uh, the second, which I think is um, relatively easy, is to set, try to set targets that people know how to reach by legitimate means. One of the characteristics of reforms going back into the 19, early 1990s is that policymakers just make up targets. And in some cases, those targets are five, six, seven times what we've ever seen people do by legitimate means. I'm on the um, Technical Advisory Committee for Kentucky, and when they introduced their new test, one of them came to a meeting and said, we've decided tentatively that we would like to require of schools gains of two-tenths of a standard deviation a year. And the whole room said, oh my god, no, 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 you can't do that. But that's typical. People just make it up. And they also, this notion of everybody reaching the same standard has the same effect. There's no country in the world where there's not a wide distribution. Uh, the third thing is to look for, try to institute countervailing incentives. We, the, the current system is really bizarre in that every single individual in the system has exactly the same incentive, which is to raise scores at the fastest rate possible. And nobody has an incentive to see how those scores are raised. That's just not going to work. The last thing I would advise, I don't know how to do. But I think it has to be done. And that is, um, a couple of us talked about this earlier, I don't think we can adequately evaluate schools without human judgment. I just don't think it can be done. And uh, if you look at how we're beginning to, as a nation, include observations in teacher uh, accountability systems, we're trying to do it without human judgment. We're trying to make it really standardized. It's not going to work. That said, it's going to be really, really hard to make it work for three reasons, and a couple of us talked about this. Two were pointed out by Brian Stetcher years ago in a paper comparing healthcare and education. In healthcare, you can monitor practice in part because you have diagnostic groupings and you have treatment protocols. We have neither, and as a result, it's very hard to get two good observers to agree on what they're looking for. All right? The other is a problem that was pointed out to me years ago by Derek Neal in the University of Chicago. Uh, in private industry, not in the for those of you who've taken a course with Ed Lazier, not in something like a, a job of putting car windshields into a car, which you, where you can measure pretty much everything that matters, but where there are complex roles to play, successful private firms typically temper, or let me say, use both objective measurements and human judgment. And one of the reasons, Derek's argument, is that works if the person doing the judging has money on the table. So if I'm working in Ed's group, and Ed really can't stand the sight of me, but I'm making a lot of money for his group. He's not going to take advantage of his power to give me a negative rating because his rating will go down because he's not bringing in money. So he's just going to have to suck it up and tolerate me. All right? In the public schools, and in fact in civil, the civil service in general, that is not true. The costs to the person doing the evaluating of being deliberately being biased, of taking personal considerations into uh, factors into consideration, for example, is zero. All right. So when you put all of those things together, uh, it's really, really, really hard to figure out how you can bring human judgment to bear in a sensible way. There are countries that do. I'll tell you one quick anecdote before we break up. Uh, there are countries that do this with inspection systems. So maybe. Six or seven years ago, I was invited to give a keynote address at a small meeting of the, the Netherlands Educational Research Association. And um, my argument was that it would be really useful to see whether we could use inspections uh, to temper the ill effects of test-based accountability. Which, and I think the answer to that is yes. But after lunch, someone from the Dutch inspectorate came in. He was not in the morning session. His first slide had his name and his title, and his second slide was a picture of a Campbell's soup can. And his talk was about gaming the inspection system. Campbell's law applied to inspections. And one of the young people I met there, then at that point, I think just out of graduate school, had done her dissertation on gaming of inspections. So, so even though I think that's one of the most important parts of a sensible accountability system. I mean, I think we have to be frank about the fact that we just don't know how to make it work. Uh, what we do know is evaluation systems that don't do it don't work. Actually, I'll give you one example. This is the example I gave when um, I got nailed in a meeting. One of my colleagues had arranged a series of meetings for Arnie Duncan and his staff when he was new, and I was asked to come to one of them, and apparently I kept using the phrase, 
other important stuff I didn't realize I had, but one of his staffers got really annoyed and said, what the hell do you mean by other important stuff? And the example I gave him, uh, and to, to put this in context, I used to be a fourth grade teacher, well, fourth to sixth, um, was my observations of fourth grade classrooms years ago when my son was about to move from third grade to fourth grade, he had had a horrible third grade experience and I told the principal, I know you don't allow it in this district, but I'm going into all of the fourth grade classrooms to observe. And one of them, I always included a math lesson, at least one, because it was usually taught so badly. And I went into one class and the teacher had something she called math log. Every day's math class started with math log, which was a single problem given to the group. You worked it however you wanted as a group, but you wrote up your own log, which was graded for logic and complete this, but not correctness. So the day I went in, I'll make this very, I'll abbreviate this because we're running out of time. She said, she said, it's time for math log and they all got excited. And right away I thought, whoa, they're excited about their math class. So they all gathered around and she said, all right, your problem for today is this. Which is stronger, a rectangle or a triangle? Right? There's all this hubbub and a few minutes later, hands went up. Hands went up. She called on someone and the person said, Miss Padilla, what do you mean by stronger? And she said, wonderful question. You could define it lots of different ways. Here's how I'm going to define it. I'm going to, if I gave you weights and had you pile them on the two shapes, which would take longer, would require more weights to, be colla to collapse? That's the stronger one. They said, oh. And they all went back to work and they all, of course, said rectangles. So when she asked for the answer and they all said rectangles, she said, okay, let me give you these. And she passed out rectangles and triangles that were made out of little strips of cardboard with clips in the corners so they could, right. And she said, play with these for a minute and see, see what you think. Huge amount of hubbub in the class. And she said, uh, she let it go for a minute and she said, who was wrong? The kids competing to show that they were wrong, right? Then she said, okay, now the hard part. Remember, this is fourth grade. She said, who would like to try to explain their mistake? And there was silence in the room for a minute and then they were competing for a chance to explain their mistakes, all right? It was the best fourth grade class I had ever seen. So I became insistent enough that they gave up and put my son in that class, and it was like that all year long. All right, so the question I asked Arnie Duncan's staff is, what are you gonna do in an accountability system that encourages that behavior, that gives that woman credit for the best fourth grade math classes I've ever seen, and second, to encourage other teachers to emulate her? Right, that's what an accountability system should do. And you can do that with an accountability system that involves human judgment. You cannot do it with one that does not involve human judgment. But that said, if you, if you said, all right, I'll give you $500,000, go design a system for the Palo Alto schools, I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah? What about student judgment? Uh, well, those of us who live and die by student judgments, uh, <laughs> um, I think that they're useful, but, um, First of all, there is some evidence for other kinds of surveys that when you get down below, um, say, age 12 or 13, surveying students gets iffier and iffier. But the incentives aren't very good for students. I mean, we pay, I, I assume people do here too, we pay an enormous amount of attention to, to student ratings of our class, which are public, by the way, at Harvard. You're given the option the first time you teach a class to withhold the evaluation. After that, they're on the web, all right? and they're used in evaluation, they're taken very seriously. But we know, and in fact, we now have these little graphs that put you in the right comparison, that if you teach a large class, you're going, your rating will go down. In many cases, if you teach a difficult class, your ratings will go down. If you teach a required class, your ratings will go way down. Uh, so there's always a risk that somebody, some group might just say, well, and actually this happened in uh, uh, performance evaluation we had of a lecturer not all that long ago. The guy was not doing a very good job, but he was a wonderful guy, and the students absolutely loved him. And if you read the, the forced choice stuff, he looked very good. Well, on some of it, not some of it, not so good. But when you read the open response questions, which we use a lot, on some of them he looked wonderful, and on some of them he was frankly really bad. But his evaluations were better than they should have been because they just loved the guy. He was supportive, he was a wonderful mentor, he just wasn't a very good teacher. Right? So, People are beginning to do it. I think the real answer is we just have to do some serious monitoring to find out how well it works. Right? I just don't know at this point. Yeah. 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 Michelle, can I ask oh. All right, last question and then we'll... Yeah, sorry, just a quick anecdote and then a final question. Mm -hmm. I was uh, walking last night with my ninth grader son and I asked uh -huh. him what he was learning in ge geometry. 
And he began to describe the Pythagorean triples. <laughs> and so he explained it to me, and I said, that's really interesting. And I naively asked him, so situate this for me. Is there some <laughs> number theoretic concept going on here? Now I feel so naive. <laughs> but I just want to say, um, the question is, since I've been doing a lot around teacher evaluation, particularly in D.C., I think there's this misconception about the role of value-added test scores. Right? Mm -hmm. It's small and shrinking, in my estimation. In D.C. In D.C. and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and for most teachers, you can't even define value-added. And for those for whom you can, they've been downgrading them under second generation iterations. Uh, not everywhere, not New York. Okay. Well, but some places, yeah. Okay. So Point I, taken. My no. sense is the teacher observation rubrics are going to increasingly grow in performance. Mm -hmm. And we sort of touched on this, but I was just wondering how you felt about the possibility of a Campbell's Law binding votes. Well, it's happened. I mean, if you go back to the literature in the 1970s, when some states like Florida used standardized teacher evaluations, people did game it. And in fact, one of the things they did, I forget the acronym for the Florida system of the time. What comes to mind is FCAT, but that's not it. That's the test. But the teachers had lessons that they called their observation lessons. And if somebody walked in the door, they just changed what they were doing. They figured out what, what scored well, and that's what they did. You know, if you read, look at the, the paper that's linked that um, Richard Rothstein did. This, I mean, this is a universal problem. This is not a testing problem. And, um, People are going to try to game systems, and you, there, there are some things you can do. I mean, you can have a, what Jim Heckman called a, a dynamic system where you're constantly changing how the, uh, how the system, what the system looks for in response to gaming, which makes comparability over time hard, uh, or you can try to really broaden things. But it's not ever, never going to completely go away. It's really a question of ameliorating it. All right, well, I think we're out of time, but we're going to have a short reception over back in Sarah. So thanks again. Sure.